O oh God, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O oh God, should mark iniquities, who would stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for God, my soul waits, and in God's word I hope. My soul waits for God, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in God, for with God there is steadfast love. With God is great power to redeem. It is God who will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, 
Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, and he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, Kwam, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. May we hear and understand what the gospel is saying to us today. There are lots of things in our lessons today. And they're kind of scattered all about, along with me and along with the week that we've been having. We've been having a pretty amazing week. I put something over here on the table. So in order to start on a positive note, I'm going to show you what I put on the table. This is what I put on the table. These are a couple of sections of the LA Times, the headlines. And many thanks, because I don't subscribe to the Times, that it was brought to me. Equal dignity under the law and the new chapter. Now, you know I won't just leave that go all day. I'll probably be talking about that. And I also can't leave go President Obama's eulogy for Clementa Pickney. But I finally got time to watch it. And was truly touched when he went through the names of each person and said that each of them found grace. I was truly touched by that. And of course, happily surprised that he actually could sing uh, as he sang Amazing Grace, which is why I played a sort of version of Amazing Grace this morning for your training. Um, all of these things are amazing in their own ways. And I'm going to go back to our scriptures and, and give us a message about that. But before I delve into that really deeply, there's a few things I want to mention so that you have them a little bit in mind when I'm talking about the rest of this. One thing is I am ecstatic about the Supreme Court decision. And normally I don't say anything very political up here. But I'm ecstatic. I'm, I'm ecstatic because of equal dignity. I will not impose my views about that on some other minister or pastor in whatever geographic area they are that holds different beliefs. I might try to convince them otherwise and teach them and share with them my experience and the reasons I feel as I do. But it is not my job or any government's job to impose a religious view on somebody. And, and what I'm delighted about is that this is a civil decision. This is a decision about people having civil rights and rights to have the same rights within the government of the land as everybody else. That means I am free to marry them wherever I am as a minister. And I don't have to worry that that marriage that I sanctify here will not be honored somewhere else. So that's why I'm delighted. And I'm fully aware that there's much more work to do. And that's part of what we're going to be reaching out for healing in, because the decision does not heal the land. So we, we do have to continue our work, but it's fabulous. 
if I do say so myself. I should have somebody otherwise qualified to say that, but anyway, it's right on. Anyway, uh, so there's that. Then there is, of course, the service for the people in Charleston. And I posted something on my blog that I shared that I had received uh, from Rick Warren. Rick Warren is the senior pastor of Saddleback Church. Saddleback is a huge, giant, megalith church down in Orange County. And there are many things that I don't like about mega megachurches. Um, but Rick has a really, really wonderful way of communicating. Hello, welcome. There's some bulletins in the back on that side for you. Yeah. Um, and he has some, some really good ways of writing and sharing. And sometimes I get something in his regular emails that I just have to share. So I did. But I know not all of you read my blog, even though you can get to it easily from the website. So I want to share that with you because this is about how do we respond? And I touched on it last week, but I love the positive things that were said in this. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to take it into our scriptures. How do we respond to such evil as happened in Charleston? And what we do is we do the exact opposite of what they wanted to accomplish. That's the only way they don't win. The intention is to divide people from each other, so we must unite in our grief. The intention was to sow seeds of hatred, so we must sow seeds of love and community. The intention is to kill, so we must live and protect life, all of it. Every life matters. The intention is to do evil, so we must respond by doing good. The intention is to start a race war. We must be peacemakers. The intention is to further segregation, so we must model integration in our churches. The intention is to do an injustice, so we must stand for justice. And when the intention is to do harm, we must be agents of healing. When we do the opposite of what this killer and others wanted to see happen, evil ultimately loses and goodness wins. Many of the family members of those murdered have modeled this response, offering forgiveness to the man who took the lives of their loved ones, even while feeling gut-wrenching grief and anger. What strength and faith that must require. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Today, even though hatred is strong in our culture, love is even stronger. And love is the only thing that can overpower evil. Love is the only way to defeat hate. He, in his list of things, said everything I wanted to say and was feeling and thought it was well worth sharing with all of you and anyone else who reads my blog and doesn't get written more in his emails. So, um, food for thought, all of that. Now, let's talk some about our lessons today. We heard a story in Mark about Jesus coming in from the sea and bunches of people there, as usual and someone hurrying to ask his help. I think it's important, and it's not just that I think it's important, it really is important, that we be able to read sort of between the lines of our Gospels and behind the words. There's, there's lots and lots of meaning there. For instance, crossings over the sea. When I was quite young, and I'd hear these stories, I always focused on this little picture. I figured, okay, they crossed the sea. Didn't even think about the crossing of the sea. But they're in this boat at the shore, and they're getting out. What was happening to those people right then, right there, when he arrives at the destination? That was plenty to concentrate on. But there was an even bigger picture. So I want us to take a moment and think about what that means. 
because a lot of times we're told that the crossings were stormy. And what did it mean that one side of that sea was Jewish territory, for the writers of this book, the us part, and the other side was Gentile territory, us and them. Can you feel that tension and risk? I mean, think about it for the first century Christian. That's, that's where they were. They were with this us then mentality. Think about it even today, border crossings in, say, North Korea or Syria. Maybe even Lebanon, maybe even Iran and Iraq right now. I don't know what's going on over there. Mexico. Border crossings anywhere are full of strife. And that's what they were doing, crossing over the sea, across the border to other people, to people that were other than them. And he was sharing his teaching with those other people. <coughs> that's a challenge, just to even get in the boat and start across the sea. In Mark, we see that tension a lot. He talks a lot about the voyages in the sea. So take some time and read Mark and look at all those sea crossings and see what was going on in there. Now, he goes back and forth and he does miracles in these stories. He is sharing his power. He is sharing his love and his healing with the other. <coughs> There's always faith or no faith. He tells someone, because you had faith, you're healed. Or how come you don't have any faith? Here, peace be still on the wind. Sometimes there's fearfulness. Just before today's story, there's another story in Mark. I almost added it in, but it would have made the reading ridiculously long. Some of you will remember this story. It is the story about when he's on the other side, just before today, right? He's on the other side, and he comes across a man that is possessed by demons. He, put, he throws the demons out of the guy and casts them into a bunch of pigs. They run over a cliff. The reaction of the people who'd been afraid of the man that was possessed by demons, quite honestly, come by that way, I'd be afraid of some of the family. They were afraid. Even now that he got rid of the demons. Instead of like, oh, thank you, oh, that's great, wow, now we can. Now the man, he was happy and he went about telling everybody how he was healed and all of that. But the people said, you know what, you better leave me all to Jesus. Just, just go away. You scare us. They did it nicely. But they were afraid of that kind of power. And they might even have been afraid of the sharing of that level of healing and faith that was coming to them that day. Our text this week, it sits on a point between faith and fear. It tells us two stories in one and both of them are taking a place on this side of the sea, the us side for the writer. This, the two passages talk about two daughters of Abraham. <coughs> women. One was a mature woman and one was 12, just barely reaching the age of womanhood. But they were both part of the us, the us that needed healing and the incidents are woven together. First, I want you to understand something about the number 12. The number 12 in Jewish thought is significant. And just to give you a few things, because I could spend a semester on it, a few things. Think about the 12 tribes. Think about the 12 apostles. Okay? Just, just a couple things. Those, those numbers have some significance. So it's really not much of a coincidence that the woman referred to in our story, who'd been hemorrhaging, had been bleeding for 12 years. It's also no coincidence that the girl was 12 years old. The woman had been bleeding for as long as the girl had been alive. And I don't think that that is just by chance. Whether this story is a real life narrative of an exact historical incident which can't really be proved. 
or whether it is an illustrative story that tells us about the power of overcoming fear and the power of overcoming prejudice. Either way, it's vitally important. Let's take another look at some important things about the society at the time. There is a taboo about being around a bleeding woman. The bleeding woman was considered to be unclean. The man couldn't have contact with her during that time. It's also interesting to note that as you go through the translation, all the stuff about uh, she'd been bleeding for 12 years, she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years, all these different ways of saying this, among them is that it is the words used mean a flow of blood. And the word about flow also can be translated as river. Now, this is one of those things where I wish I knew a whole lot more about Hebrew and Greek. I don't. I do all right. But I don't have any sort of, you know, master's knowledge of that. I've got to look it up. All right. But her life had been just swept along in this river of blood for 12 years. I gotta tell you, I would be awfully tired. 12 years of bleeding. 12 years of my life force leaving me. When humanity received the breath of God, if I want to be a scientist about it, and say, we started to get oxygen into our bodies, which came into our blood and gives us our very life. Very concise scientific statement, obviously, not more to that. But if we are bleeding for 12 years, we are losing our breath. Some of that oxygen and that life within us is going out. And yet this woman had the faith to reach out and say, if I can just touch this teacher's, this healer's garment, I can be healed. Now, one of the advantages of having grown up and worked in about 30 different denominations is that I can look at this as a simple story and say, how fabulous is this woman's faith? It is truly her faith to know that if she just reaches out and touches this garment of this being of power, that she will be healed. I can also look at it from a much more humanistic, almost you to you point of view and say that this woman knew that she had to reach out to power. This woman is us, needing healing, losing our life and our breath, and everything that is meaningful to us, but accepting the fact that in order to be healed, in order to be whole, we have to be willing to accept the gift and to reach out and take it. You can go all levels in between all kind of denominations. I can probably give you a Presbyterian version and a Catholic version. I'm not going to. All right. But you get it. You can personalize this for yourself. If you need healing in your life, whatever that healing might be, it might be that you feel you need forgiveness for something. It might be that you feel you need to forgive somebody else. It might be that you feel like you need to accept gifts. It might be that you feel like you need somebody to recognize your worth as a being. Whatever it is, you've got to be willing to reach out and take the gift. Because truly, 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 it is offered. Let's talk about the girl and the synagogue official. This man was a very important man. And here he is, reduced by fear to go chasing after some itinerant preacher, faith healer walking around the desert. 
He's desperate. His daughter is dying. Interestingly enough, at the time, if you look at the whole cultural world with Jesus, about 60% of live births at the time ended up with the child dying by their mid-teens. I read this book. It said that before the scientific age, people didn't really allow themselves to get too terribly attached emotionally to their children because so many of them, before vaccinations and hospitals, prenatal care of any sort, died so young. The gift of a child often seemed at the time to be too precarious to, to thoroughly invest one's heart in, even though one wants to. You're just a little bit conscious, what if I lose it? Yet this man can't bear to lose his little girl. And this was at a time when daughters were not valued so much as sons. It, it's fascinating to me, this particular story, that this man was high up in the synagogue in a culture that did not value women as much as men, was so desperate to save the life of his little girl in a culture that gave up on kids that get sick, he went after this itinerant preacher guy, the one who had so many clashes with the scribes and the Pharisees and all those people. He's risking a lot. He thinks, maybe I'll be ridiculed, I don't care, I love my daughter, I want to try everything. I want to reach out and see if I can get healing for her. And he's probably desperate Probably more desperation rather than faith actually drives him to Jesus. But this is the last chance in his mind. So then he gets there, after the little interruption with the woman touching the hem of the garment. He gets closer and someone comes up and says, Ah, you're too late now. Charity died. But Jesus goes, Hey, don't worry about it. Just play. Come on, let's go. And so they go. They go to his house. And she said, and Jesus says, you know what? She's just asleep. Okay, here we go. Historically, do we have a girl who's in a coma? Maybe. Do we have a girl who actually really died? Who Jesus raised from the dead? Maybe. Do we have someone who's been alive for as long as this other woman's life has been draining out? who shows us about the recovery of life, who shows us about receiving that breath of life and receiving that healing and be willing to take a risk of being ridiculed by your peers or made fun of, taking a risk of accepting a gift. Because you know, when we receive a gift from someone, whether that gift is love or a tangible thing, a cutting board that looks like a violin, I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, we take a risk because we're receiving something that now we have responsibility for. Anything that we accept and bring into our lives we hold a responsibility to take care of it. The cutting board. It was a birthday present. It ended up being a birthday present because they figured that was the best time finally. The story started much earlier. It was made by um, brother-in-law. Brother yeah. Uh, uh, Georgia. And it's, it's really cool. It's made of wood that looks like a violin, like that sort of half symbol, the logo for the orchestra thing. And um, I said, I can't decide what to do with it because I don't want to mess it up by cutting things on it. Said, you know, so he said, that's what it's for. <laughs> I said, okay, 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 you know. So, but when we get a gift, we are responsible for it when we accept it. So what do we do with that? As for me, I think I got a gift this last week. Even though in California, 
marriage was already legal for same-sex couples, and I was already able to marry them. A lot of people got a gift. People that didn't even know they got a gift, okay? Not just same-sex couples that now can get married, but the rest of our communities and our societies, they got a gift whether they want it or not. We are now more of a community and a, as a whole. What this does, this gift, and what this gift in our story, the healing of the woman who was hemorrhaging and the healing of the little girl, it makes more room in their lives and in the lives of their communities for even more compassion. It makes more room for now doing something with those gifts. The gift of finally being able to live your life and not to be a taboo that someone can't even touch or talk to for this woman who was bleeding. I think some of my friends in the gay community will identify with being taboo. The little girl, back to life, has a whole lifetime ahead of her. And what is it that Jesus says at the end of that story? The very end of our reading, he says something. He told them, give her something to eat. Feed her. Take care of her. She is a gift to you again. When he talks to his disciples and the people around him, and he says, you know what? She's just asleep. We're going to go and heal her. When he talks to Jairus, he says, don't listen to them. Just trust me. He'd cross a stormy sea to come over and end up healing two people right away. Must have been a pretty tender scene in the house. Wailing and weeping outside, but inside, where he goes in with just the father and heals the girl. Calm, confident, She's sleeping. Little girl, get up. Receive your gift of life. And he doesn't miss the most ordinary details of compassion. So our questions. Are we open to God's generosity and God's gifts? Are we open to receiving the healing not just for each and every individual one of ourselves, but for our community and our nation? Are we ready to receive the healing that can come from some of the events of this week? Are we ready to take the healing that we need from the events of Charleston? Are we ready to take on the grace of God and share it? How many daughters lay dying now? What sort of miracle would it take for us to transform the systems of our world so that all people, and especially children, can be healthy and rise up to new life? How many people are dying, maybe not physically, but spiritually and emotionally and are full of hurt and anger and fear. I think there's probably a lot of fear out there right now. It's really up to each and every one of us to embrace the grace of God and to not be afraid and to help other people not be afraid. And it's up to each and every one of us to rise up from partial lives to fully living in the grace of God. So I want you to think about something. And then I'm going to do something a little different than what we usually do. So we're not quite done with this. First, I want
want you to think about something. What miracles do you have in your own life? What miracles have you missed when they happened, only to perceive them much later? Do we participate in miracles? Or do they just happen to us? And how can these stories and what's been happening in our country apply to our life as a congregation today? Now here's one I think we can answer. Probably you can answer it out loud, some of you. Are there churches that appear to be dying or dead, yet they rise up and live? I know one of those. One more question that's not a big general one. This is just about our stories. Why do you think that in this narrative we are told that Jesus lets that woman with the hemorrhage delay him on the way to the house of the synagogue leader. Would he have gotten there before everybody figured out oh, it's too late now she died if he hadn't stopped for the woman with the hemorrhage? Just a question. Was it perhaps to show that power and that faith? Now, here's the part that's different that we're going to close this sermon with. I know that there are things in my life that I need healing for. And I know that there are those among us that need healing in different ways. Some of us need healing in a physical sense, and some of us need healing in a spiritual and emotional sense. But I'd be willing to bet that every single one of us has something that's bothering us about something. And that's a call for healing. Now, what I would like to see us do, and what I'm going to invite you to do, I'm not going to make you talk out loud, because that's probably too scary for this particular congregation just yet. But, if you have something in your life that needs healing. All I'm going to ask you to do right now is I'm going to take about 10 or 15 seconds and I'm going to be quiet. And you can close your eyes. Maybe I should ask you to close your eyes so people are safe. But if you have something that needs healing, I want you to just raise your hand. And when you do, after a few seconds, then I'm just going to pray, and then we'll move on with our service. So if you need healing in any area of your life, please raise your hand, and as you raise that hand, be willing to claim your healing. Creator, healer, God, you see these, the hands of your people, willing to reach out to you and receive your grace and your healing power in their lives, in the lives of their communities. We pray right now your healing spirit upon each and every one. And we pray that you will give us each the faith, the power, the trust, and the ability to, as we reach up, to receive your gift and hold it and take it into ourselves and be truly healed. We pray for the strength to do the work that comes after the gift to practice the healing and the grace in our lives. We thank you for the gifts and for the answers you've already given us. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you. Our hymn of response is number 396, When Charity and Love Prevail. And it'll take me just a second to get back up to the piano and play an introduction.
see everyone. Um, today is probably going to be our last uh, little talk about stewardship. And for those who are new, stewardship, this is our six month um, uh, fundraiser, you might say, for the church. Uh, and it's, but there's something more that I want to touch on. It's not just give us your money. It's a sense of belonging. When I came to Bethel, I was looking for something. I'm sure all of you have been looking for something. And we made the choice to be here. I made the choice to be here. And I got what I was looking for. And to me, to tithe, to give money, to give back what Bethel has given me, I am so honored to do that. I take my responsibility as financial secretary not because you need me, I need you. I'm an empty nester, I'm a mom. I need someone to take care of. This is my family. We want to be your family. And there's things that we need here just like your home and your family. We need you know, our lights to be paid. We need to pay for those that do the work here, our pastor, our taxes, all that stuff. We know that. But we also need you. We need your help. We need your talents. You got to eat my cooking. I mean, that's great. But there's so many talents that we all have, and money's not just anything, everything. This is belonging. And that's my appeal for this stewardship. It's a six month pledge right now. Come November, we'll do a full year. But this is a good time to see what can you do for Bethel? What can Bethel do for you? And we're here for you. And we need you. If you can donate um, by tithing, if you can donate by your time, it's all welcome, and it's all appreciated, and we appreciate you. You had a choice. You had a choice to be here. There's many other choices, uh, churches up and down you, but you found something here, and no matter who you are, you're welcome here, and I felt that, and I know that when I came here, I came with absolutely no real knowledge of a church, of a community, of belonging. And I have found that just recently in the last two years. I want to be here. I want to be here on Sundays, every Sunday. And when I'm not here, you can still send, I can still know that I can donate my time and my money other days. And that's a good feeling. And it's a good feeling to be wanted. We want you. We love you. We need you. And God needs you. And for your stewardship, we have the forms here in your bulletin. Really seriously look at it and see what can you give back. And what do you want Bethel to give to you that you can participate in? For others. So I hope we all really get a chance to look at it carefully. Um, and then I don't know where we're collecting them, but you can put them in your in your offering plate. But um, um, six months is not a long time, and it's a good chance to see just where you're at. And you'll be blessed. I mean, pay it forward. Thank you.